All right. Hello, everyone. I am so glad you're here joining us tonight. I'm Susan Walther. I'm the president of our Texas Master Naturalist Coastal Prairie Chapter, who's putting on this program tonight. The Texas Master Naturalist Program is a volunteer organization with 50 chapters across the state. We're sponsored by Texas Parks and Wildlife and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Our chapter, Coastal Prairie, is located right next to Houston, serving Fort Bend, Waller, and Wharton counties. And we have about 220 members and growing, growing every year with two training classes. Last year, our single chapter volunteered over 25,000 hours in our community. And through our outreach, we informed about 25,000 adults and children on topics uh, from bats, birds, butterflies, bugs, and what lives inside healthy soil. And whenever we inform people, we always try to teach them how everything in nature, including us, is interconnected and how important locally native plants are and proper man landscape management is to improving wildlife diversity. Uh, I mentioned our chapter offers two training classes. We have registration open right now. And I put a link to the registration in chat. We've had a lot of applicants and you will be contacted in the order that you, that you put in your information. So you, I had already had a chat about that and yes, you will be contacted. Um, we're so glad to have Doug Tallamy here with us tonight for our monthly public program. And I'm, ex I'm hoping that everyone here is going to come away from tonight with ideas on how we can improve our, our own landscapes for wildlife diversity. If every one of us does a little bit, together we can make a large positive change. Please post your questions in the chat. We have people monitor monitoring that and we'll get as many of your questions asked after the program as we can. I'd like to invite our volunteer service and outreach director, Jan Piskovsky, to introduce Doug. Thank you, Susan. When I first reached out to Doug in December of 2022 to find out about his availability, February of 2024 seemed really far away, but here we are, and I'm very excited to introduce him. Doug Tallamy is a T.A. Baker Professor of Agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored 112 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for 43 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His books include Bringing Nature Home, the Living Landscape, co-authored with Rick Dark, Nature's Best Hope, a New York, best, New York Times bestseller, and The Nature of Oaks, winner of the American Horticultural Society's 2022 Book Award. In 2021, he co-founded Homegrown National Park with Michelle Alfandari. His awards include recognition from the Garden Writers Association, Audubon, the National Wildlife Federation, Allegheny College, Eco Foresters, the Garden Club of America, and the American Horticultural Association. Please help me welcome Dr. Doug Tallamy with Homegrown National Park. Well, th thanks very much, Jan. You know, I always have mixed feelings when I talk to uh, a master naturalist group because the you know the upside is you you really appreciate everything I I say and and that's great. The downside is you already know most of this, so. Uh, Sometimes I feel a little silly, but we're going to talk about Homegrown National Park anyway, building networks for life. Before we do that, let me ask you what this is. You know, it looks like a fecal sac. Of course, birds in nests don't want their babies pooping in the nest, so they've evolved uh, a mechanism where all the feces are contained in a little sac, and the parents pick up the sac and, and fly out and just drop it. Uh, so that's what this looks like. It looks like a fecal sac that's, that's splatted on a leaf. It's actually a bola spider. <clears throat> they sit on the top of the leaf because that's where a fecal sac would be. But at night, uh, they really do look like a spider. They hang down from a leaf and drop a single strand of silk, put one sticky glob of glue at the end there, and then they go hunting. Now, you wouldn't think that anything would fly into a single target like that. A web would be a better idea, but they do. Catch moths. Moths fly in on a regular basis. They spin them around, wrap them all up in silk, and then they have a good meal. 
Then they go hunting again and catch another moth. And then they go hunting again and catch another moth. And when they've had enough uh, nutrition, they will spin an egg, egg sack. Guess what an egg sack looks like? All the eggs are in the middle there. And that's how they overwinter in an egg sack. And if they're very successful hunters, they'll make two or three egg sacks and hang them right next to each other. Well, the real question is, why are moths flying into this single target? Uh, and, and there's actually a good reason. She is releasing the sex pheromone of a uh, particular species of male of moths. So the males of that species will fly in thinking she's a female. She is, but she's the wrong species. And I was interested uh, to find out what the species of moth in my yard was that she was attracting. So I unwrapped the little bodies that she cut loose, and it turned out it's the bronze cutworm. Every single moth that uh, the, my bola spider was catching was a male bronze cutworm. And I've got bronze cutworms, adults, because I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars. And I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got goldenrod, which is their primary host plant. I also have this beautiful moth, the dot line white, because I've got oak trees, primarily white oaks, and because I don't rake the leaves away from under those oak trees. There is a dot line white cocoon in this, this mass of leaves. And when you're raking leaves, you wouldn't see it, believe me. There it is right there. There it is up close, blends in really well. Uh, so that's one of the things you lose when you rake up your leaves, you're losing an awful lot of creatures that are part of those leaves. I've got the evening primrose moth because I've got evening primrose, which I planted so that that moth would come. And it did come. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. And sometimes it's crowded in there, but uh, it's always very cute. I've got zebra swallowtails because I planted pawpaws. Took nine years for the zebra swallowtails to find my pawpaws, but they did. And I've got a good population of both. We got a lot of pawpaws too. It would take me a long time to describe all the species that are now making a living at, at our house. Uh, primarily because we put the plants back. It would not take me very long to describe what's happening on a typical residential landscape. Um, there are no the populations of goldenrod, so there's no bronze cutworm, so there's no bola spider. There are no white oaks, so there's no dot line whites. There's no evening primrose, so there's no evening primrose moth. There's no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtail. There is very little that can live in a typical residential landscape, and we've got 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the US. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing some scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here, we're talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of earth wildlife already gone. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, hasn't happened yet, but that is the prediction. And they say in the next 20 years, of course, this is a prediction we've got to make sure it does not happen. 40% of the Earth's plants face extinction. Not good news at all. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write this book, The Sixth Extinction, talking about the tremendous loss of life on, on planet Earth that is happening right now. Um, and that's the sixth time it has happened on the planet. But this is the first time it's, it's being caused by uh, a living being. And that, of course, is us. Now, uh, you know, people are upset about the loss of biodiversity, um, and there are scientists that are interested in our reactions to the loss of, of biodiversity. And Richard Hobbs is one of those people, and he's, he says that our reaction follows the five stages of grief that we typically experience when we hear we have a terminal disease. There's denial, and we certainly have a lot of denial out there. Anger, I felt that sometimes. Bargaining, oh, what can we do to make it a little bit better? Depression, hard to fight that off. And then the fifth stage is acceptance. But we have to push back on acceptance because acceptance is equivalent to giving up and giving up is not an option because losing nature is not an option. That is what keeps us alive on this planet. So let's talk about a fifth stage and that is action. There are things we can actually do to, to stem the flow of biodiversity from our landscapes. We do have parks, we do have preserves. Um, our our uh, national parks primarily were established because they were such exquisitely beautiful places. And Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with that. He said, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by the considerations of good administration. So he's patting himself on the back, and as he should, of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. So in other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. 
they were not created with conservation in, in mind. And that's one of the reasons we, we probably only have 3.6% of the U.S. in national parks. If you compare that to Costa Rica, I think Costa Rica has over 20% of their, their territory in national parks. Only 12% of the U.S. is federally protected, which means 88% is not. But people still wonder, why aren't the parks that we have and the preserves that we have enough to sustain the biodiversity that we need? And there are a couple of answers to that, but one of them is that they're too small. Uh, so if you take a, a large area like this and you shrink it down to a little fragment of its former self, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that's the problem. Small populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why is that? Well, because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up, and in bad times, they go down. If you're a, a large population, the top line here, even in your down cycles, there's enough individuals so you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population, in those normal cycles, you often hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, and then you're gone. And unless you recolonize that patch, uh, you're, you're permanently gone. And recolonizing patches these days is, is harder and harder. Imagine a box turtle crossing a major highway. It just doesn't happen. So that means it's local extinction when these, these uh, species disappear from their habitat patches. And studies all over the world, some of them quite long, over 100 years in length, are telling us the same thing. We have not left enough nature on the planet to sustain the amount of functional ecosystems required to, to um, keep us alive on the planet. It's that simple. Now, we tend to use extinction as a metric of, of trouble. We always talk about things going extinct. We don't want them to go extinct. Um, I don't like that because that's like going to the doctor when you're dead. It's a little late. Uh, I think it's better to look at the loss of species, the reduction in the numbers of species that were once very common. Uh, so things like the, the American chestnut used to be the dominant tree from Maine all the way to Georgia along the crest of the Appalachians. Um, it's not extinct, but it's functionally extinct. The chestnut black came, light came in and took out uh, these, these wonderful trees uh, and a tremendous amount of ecosystem function along with it. <clears throat> the rusty patch bumblebee. Not long ago, just a few years ago, it was one of the most common bumblebees uh, in, in the continent. Now, if you see one, it's a big deal because they are on the brink of extinction. So not gone officially, but functionally, they are gone. They're no longer performing their role in the ecosystems. Beavers, now beavers are not extinct and they're actually coming back in some places, but they had de uh, established, determined the hydrology of the entire continent before uh, Europeans came and essentially trapped them all out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so the, the hydrology of the entire country changed dramatically and it's still changed. So wherever beavers are coming back, they're, they're starting to fix it, but um, functionally over most of the continent, continent, they are gone. So we're really talking about defaunation, not extinction, but defaunation, the reduction in the abundance of species that runs ecosystems. That's the real problem. It's local, it's everywhere, and we tend not to even notice it. <clears throat> and we don't notice it because of a phenomenon called shifting baseline. We tend to think that the way things were when we were kids uh, is normal. That's the way they've always been. It's the way they always will be. Uh, so we don't, if you're born into a, a world that is already defaunated, if you already have very little life around you, you think that's normal, which means you're not upset about it and you don't do anything about it. None of us missed the passenger pigeon because it was extinct before any of us were born. It was the most common bird on the entire planet. So shifting baseline means that we're losing the biodiversity that sustains us and we don't even notice it. So what are we going to do? Uh, well, you know, there is some good news. Uh, and, and believe it or not, one of the pieces of good news is that um, the UN has noticed. They had a big, big meeting last year, I guess, uh, in Montreal to talk about the biodiversity crisis, recognizing that it's not just climate change that's a problem. We've got a biodiversity crisis. So they do what the UN does. They, they talk about it, and the idea is to make resolutions. But this was a headline that came out of that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. So we are negotiating whether or not we're going to protect the ecosystems that keep us alive in this planet. Um, and 
in the end, I guess they'll pass some resolutions and then, you know what, we'll ignore them. At least that's been the pattern in the past. So I'm not going to de depend on the UN to, to solve the problem. Let's look at, at what E.O. Wilson suggests we do. Uh, he, of course, is a very famous professor at Harvard. He died uh, two years ago. <clears throat> but in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Very powerful statement. Or it's going to disappear everywhere, and that includes humans. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He did not tell us how we were going to save life on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a, a conservation biologist, that's a great idea. We will just put half the Earth aside, and all those things that are in trouble can be in that half. Uh, we humans will be in the other half, and it'll all be great. Problem is, half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of, of agriculture, and I don't see us uh, diminishing that. And of course, we got 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our uh, hardscape and, and airports and roadways and detritus. Uh, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So what are we going to do? Well, I think we can realize uh, E.O. Wilson's dream. But we need a new approach to conservation to do it. We need to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. You know, for ages, we have had this idea that humans are here and nature someplace else. Uh, and we tend to get rid of nature wherever we, we live. Uh, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Um, not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and save uh, practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just going to do conservation over here. We're going to do it over here. But look, there's not much to conserve over here. So we have to move beyond conservation into restoration. We actually have to rebuild it. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So here's the basic problem. We've taken the amount of nature, you know, nature used to be everywhere out there. We've shrunken it down into little teeny habitat patches, which are now tiny and isolated from each other. Uh, so fragmentation is, is the problem. And what is proposed is to build biological corridors that connect those isolated habitat fragments so that they're not isolated anymore. So that plants and animals can move back and forth between these viable habitats. This is pretty much no man's land in here now, but you build these carters, they can move back and forth, and at least you get genetic these populations. Uh, but the basic problem persists. They're still tiny populations. So when they fluctuate, they can still blink out of their habitat patch. So I'm gonna propose that we need more than carters. We need to actually construct viable habitat outside of our, our, uh, our parks. This is good, that's even better. <clears throat> so the light areas here could be where our cities are, where much of our agriculture is, but we're basically talking about um, restoring ecosystem function on the land in between parks, and that is private property, which means we need a new attitude about property rights. You know, we all think we all have the, the, the right to do whatever we want on our private property. You know, we own it. Um, this is our castle and we're the kings of that castle and don't tell us what to do. The problem is our properties are, are not like Las Vegas. You know that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Some of you might, might really know that. But what happens on our properties does not stay on our properties. That's the ecological problem. Our properties are all part of a greater local ecosystem. So whatever we do on our property impacts the entire ecosystem for good or for bad. Let's just talk about what happens when you have a lot of lawn. Um, the amount of lawn you have is going to determine whether rain infiltrates uh, during a storm or whether it leaves a storm water runoff. It's going to determine whether you're adding pollutants to your local watershed, whether you're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides, all the stuff we put on our lawns. It's going to determine how much carbon that you are adding to the atmosphere every time you mow that lawn. It's also going to uh, determine how well you're supporting pollinators. Lawn doesn't support any pollinators because you have eliminated the resources that they need. Um, the plants you choose for your landscape is going to determine how much carbon you're actually removing from the atmosphere 
uh, you build plant material out of that carbon, but even more important, plants are pumping carbon into the soil through their, their root systems. Uh, so you don't need giant trees. Uh, prairie plants pump a lot of carbon into the soil, but lawn does not. <clears throat> Our plant choices are going to determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors like calorie pear or privet or, or uh, uh, Brazilian pepper tree, all the, the, the uh, invasives that we have brought into uh, this country, which don't stay on our property. They escape and become, uh, again, they're ecological tumors that castrate local ecosystem function by pushing out the native plants that do support those ecosystems. And finally, the plants we choose for our landscapes is going to determine how well we're supporting the insects that support the local food web. <clears throat> so how we landscape, how much lawn we have, is going to uh, help determine how much life Earth can sustain. In other words, the carrying capacity of our local ecosystems. And that is an awesome responsibility. And it's an awesome responsibility that most landowners do not know they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. There are millions of us out there. There are millions of us out there. And if each one of us accepted the responsibility of basic conservation, we really could get ahead of this problem. Uh, so where are we going to do this conservation? We let's, let's talk about private property. Those millions of people that are out there own private property. 78% of the lower 48 states is privately owned. 85.6% east of the Mississippi is privately owned. I think 95% of Texas is privately owned. Um, so conservation has to happen on, on private property and that makes private property owners the hope and future of, of conservation. And again, they don't know that. Let's talk again about, about lawn. It is the low hanging fruit out there. We can do what we want with it. Uh, without too much pushback from, from anybody. <clears throat> now we've got 44 million acres of lawn nationwide. That's the latest figure I've seen. And we have lawn because it's a status symbol. It's a very well accepted status symbol. And because we have to display our, our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut the area of lawn in half? Now notice I'm not saying get rid of lawn. It's got important functions, but let's cut that area in half um, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres. We're going to cut that in half. That'll give us 20 million acres that we can restore right where we live. And that's enough to create what we call homegrown national park. And it'll be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park uh, in the country. Uh, and it's real now, uh, we, it's small nonprofit, and I mean small. <clears throat> uh, and the idea is to register your property on the map. So wherever you live, you register that, that location uh, and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. Maybe you really are going to reduce the area of lawn in half. Maybe you're going to put an oak tree in your yard. Maybe you're going to plant an aster in a flower pot. It doesn't matter how little uh, of, of uh, the amount of conservation you're going to do, but then your piece of your county is going to light up with a firefly. And you get to see uh, you know, how many other people in your county have joined Homegrown National Park. And the object, of course, is to uh, reach the non-choir. You know, the, the you folks already know that we have to do this, but most people do not. So we want to get that message to go viral. Our mission is to motivate millions of people so that we can regen by, regenerate biodiversity. We want to plant natives. We want to remove invasives from our property, and we want to reshape our relationship with, with nature. So here are our existing national parks. We want to turn it into this. That seems pretty easy. What are we asking? Well, we really do want to reduce the area of lawn. Lawn is not accomplishing any of the ecological goals our properties have to accomplish. And we want to replace some of that lawn with the natives that do accomplish those goals. Again, we want to remove invasives from our, our properties. Uh, we want, if you're protecting some natural area, you certainly want to keep doing that. There are real ecological products associated with Homegrown National Park, a significant increase in biodiversity. And I'll give you some examples of, of that in a few minutes. Uh, and if any of you have tried this, you can see it right at, at home. It really works. 
Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody got rid of the invasive plants on their property, and most people do have them, um, we'd be 78% done in the entire country. We'd be 85% done in, uh, in the east of the Mississippi. If you convert your lawn into a planting like this or just about anything else, there's going to be a significant drawdown of atmospheric CO2 uh, because lawn is the worst plant for sequestering carbon. Everything else is better. And we're going to start to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Any bit of conservation we do outside of a park helps conservation inside of the park. There are also important sociological, uh, sociological products um, that we get from Homegrown National Park. National awareness, not just of what the problems are, but what the solutions are and what our roles as, as private citizens, what our roles are in, in those solutions. We are really trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature's not optional. It's essential. It's essential for everybody. And that means everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we want to merge, excuse me, existing national uh, uh, conservation organizations like Audubon, like National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, Sierra Club, Land Conservancies, all onto one visual that we call the biodiversity map. There's a lot of good conservation happening on private properties, but nobody's looking at, at that in aggregation. You know, we've got the 30 by 30 initiative. We're going to save 30% of the U.S. by 2030. Uh, it's a great goal, but it's not going to happen if we don't count conservation on private property. Now, there's urgency in enacting the homegrown national park solution. Remember the 135 million acres of residential landscape? That's a big job. So we all need get, to get to work and we have to understand what it is we're trying to do. What do we need to know to succeed? Well, let's think about our yards. There are four things every single landscape has to accomplish if we're gonna reach a sustainable relationship with mother nature. Every landscape has to support a viable food web. Every landscape has to sequester carbon, pull carbon out of the atmosphere, tie it up in, in plants and pump that extra carbon into the soil. Every landscape has to manage the watershed in which it lies, and every landscape has to support pollinators, not for agriculture, but because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Again, lawn does none of those things, which is why I keep picking on, on lawn. It is the, the easy target right now. <clears throat> Plant choice. Plant choice matters. We've got to get that, that message, uh, another one to go viral. Um, the plants you choose are going to determine how well you are, are supporting the local food web. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to the local food web, plants that do not contribute energy to the local food web, and plants that actively remove energy from the local food web. The very best contributor across the country in 84% of the counties in which they occur is one of the oaks. We have 91 species of oaks in this country, and they are contributing more energy to local food webs than any other plant genus by far. A good example of a non-contributor would be a, a ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia. It's a nice ornamental tree, has good fall color, but nothing eats a ginkgo, which means it's not adding energy, any energy to the local food web. And a good example of a detractor, there are lots of good examples of detractors. Any of the invasive plants we brought in that uh, are not contributing energy, but they are pushing out the plants that do contribute energy. So they're actually removing energy from the local food web. <clears throat> We need to, to gain a new appreciation for how important caterpillars are in local food webs. Uh, this, is, this is relatively new. We haven't been thinking about this a long time. But it turns out, and Dan Jansen noticed it a long time ago, uh, that it is caterpillars that are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. Most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that ate those plants. And again, most of those invertebrates are caterpillars. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And that's why keystone plants are so important in our restorations, because they are supporting the most caterpillars. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take it out of the arch, the arch collapses. But if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building as the, 
two by fours that, that support that house. They are the support system. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. So what are the best keystone plants where you live? Well, you go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the, the uh, best woody plant and herbaceous plant genera in your county will pop up. These are just uh, uh, examples and, and it's a much bigger list than this. Um, and they're ranked in terms of the number of caterpillar species that they, they support. So the old excuse of, I don't know what to, to plant. That's just an excuse now. You do know what to plant native plant finder. Um, you know, E.O. Wilson told us lots of wonderful things and we've got to go back and revisit those things uh, because they really are the key to the success that, that we need to have in conservation. And one of the most important things he told us is that insects are the little things that run the world. And if we lose them, life is going to change. Life as we know it depends on insects. And most of the insects that are eating plants out there can only eat particular plants. They are host plant specialists. As a matter of fact, 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to circumvent the plant defenses that, that every plant has. They have specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize the insect's exposure to all the, the chemical defenses. But it takes a long, uh, long period of, of interacting with the plant lineages for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant. So let's use the, the monarch butterfly as an example because you already know most of what's going on with the monarch. It, of course, is a host plant specialist on, on milkweeds. <clears throat> and milkweeds are toxic plants. Milkweeds are filled with cardiac glycosides, which is why we don't eat them. And if we do eat them, our heart stops. I used to say we'd have a heart attack, but there was a, a physician in the audience who said, no, your heart will stop, but it will not be a heart attack. All right. Um, so don't eat a milkweed. It also is filled with, with sticky latex sap. So when you break open uh, a, a milkweed leaf, all this white goo comes out and on exposure to air, that gels into a gummy thing. And if it gets smeared on an insect's mouth part, it glues its mouth shut. Very, very effective defense. Well, monarch caterpillars are very good at getting around both of those defenses. They have the enzymes that that store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides, and they also have behavioral adaptations of snipping midribs or or entire stems, uh, which blocks the flow of the the sticky latex sap, and then they can eat the leaf beyond that that snip, um, which allows them to eat a plant that most other insects cannot eat because they don't have those adaptations. The important point here is that monarchs are not special. 90% of the insects out there have adaptations towards particular plant lineages, but it locks them into those plant lineages. So if we put in plants from someplace else, the food web collapses. We have to think uh, <clears throat> very seriously about those pollinators. Now, we're, we're getting pretty good at doing this. The country has, has um, talked a lot about pollinators. There's pollinator pathways in the Northeast all over the place. Uh, we started thinking about it because of the, the reduction in, in uh, honeybee numbers from colony collapse disorder. But again, I want to emphasize, we need pollinators everywhere, not just in agriculture. The media will tell you that uh, they, they pollinate a third of our crops. It's really about a twelfth of our crops. Um, what they don't tell you is even if they pollinated none of our crops, we can't lose our pollinators because, again, they are pollinating 80 percent of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So losing our pollinators is not an option. We have to begin to appreciate how important leaf litter is. It does so many important things. When it falls to the ground, it, it uh, forms a protective blanket that keeps the soil, uh, the, the moisture in the soil. There are more species that live in the soil than above the soil. Most of them are detritivores. They're breaking down these leaves, returning nutrients to the soil. But all of that, those, those soil organisms require high humidity. And that's what leaves are doing. They're protecting that humidity. <clears throat> and they're also returning, they're recycling the nutrients that the plants used the year before. So all the nutrients that your trees used are locked up in these leaves. If you don't get those nutrients back into the soil, if you rake those leaves away year after year after year, you're starving your, your trees. 
people say, well, I can't keep the leaves on my property because my plants won't be able to get through them. Well, who was raking the leaves before we got here? Uh, plants are good at getting through leaf litter, normal layers of leaf litter. If you pile it five feet thick, yes, they can't get through it. But normal layers, no problem. Um, so we, we have to give our plants a little bit more credit than we are. Put the leaves near your trees. Um, this is a, a uh, population of white snake root at my house that I did not plant. And I also don't rake my leaves. I don't have time to do that. They're all down there. No problem getting through these, these uh, normal layers of leaf litter. Light pollution. Light pollution is killing our insects. It's one of the major causes of insect decline. Uh, but this is, this is actually good news because there is an easy solution to the light pollution problem. And that is that nocturnal insects are not attracted to yellow wavelengths. So if we replace our white bulbs with yellow bulbs overnight, we can reduce the, the slaughter of insects by millions. Uh, and if we use LEDs, we can also save millions of, of dollars. And then finally, we've got to, we got to think about mosquito fogging. It's a booming business around the country. Uh, and, and the mosquito foggers say that it's just fine because what they're fogging is, is an organic product. It's a natural product. And they're right. It's pyrethroids. Uh, that's the compound that is made by chrysanthemums to kill insects. It's industrial strength pyrethroids, but it is an organic compound, just like cyanide, just like ricin. Plants make some really toxic things. So being organic doesn't, doesn't uh, mean too much to me. They also say it only kills mosquitoes. That's not even close to true. It kills all the insects it comes in contact with, including the poor monarch, which is now red listed, <clears throat> by the way. This is, uh, these are just a few of the th literally thousands of monarchs that were killed in a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island a few years ago. My friend uh, picked up a handful, um, but believe me, that fogging kills more than, than mosquitoes. The interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes. You can't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You've got to kill 90% of them to do that. So you control them in the larval stage. And a good way to do that is with mosquito dunks. You get a bucket and you fill it full of water. You put in a handful of straw or hay or, or maybe some, some leaves, put it out in the sun for a few days and you build up a population of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So this becomes an irresistible brew to any, any female mosquitoes in your yard. They will lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12 for a season's worth of control. This is Bacillus thuringiensis. That's a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's very targeted, it's cheap. And if everybody did it, it would work a whole lot better than mosquito fogging does. We wanna to start to appreciate how important small properties are. 82% of us live in cities. So, you know, you're not off the hook. If you live in a city, your small property can really contribute. This is Pam Carlson's house in, in Chicago. It's one tenth of an acre. Um, and, and by the way, it's 100% it's native plants, except for this little bit of lawn here. Um, and it's beautiful. So people say, ah, oh, you can't use natives uh, in a pretty way. Yes, you can. Pam is a native plant landscaper and she knows what she's doing. But she's recorded 125 species of birds that have used her, her property because she removed her non-natives and put in native plants. So we don't want to give up on small properties. And if you have no property at all, but you have space for a container like a balcony or a porch, um, important native plants and containers uh, also are, are uh, big uh, additions to um, their great resource for local bee populations and migrating monarchs. Uh, and if you want to know what the best container plants are in the eco region in which you, you live, go to, again, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and look for the section on container plants. Uh, and then you can pick out the best ones for, for your county. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and biodiversity crises. Our two uh, major crises today, they both can be solved in, uh, or at least not totally solved, but we can help both of them um, in the same way. And that is through conservation. And fortunately, conservation works. This is the Natchusa grasslands in Illinois. It's 3,800 acres, more than 730 native plant species are growing there now. 180 species of birds have been recorded there. It used to be a cornfield. The message here is that nature is resilient. Uh, it really does come back. 
Uh, will it come back to to its full, you know, vibrance? Um, not immediately, but uh, certainly a whole lot better than a cornfield. This is uh, this is my house, our house, where Cindy and I live uh, in in uh, southeast Pennsylvania, Oxford, Pennsylvania. We got ten acres of a farm that was broken up um, back in the year two thousand. So. Um, it, it was a very old farm, but farmed almost 300 years. And the last thing they did was mow it for hay. <clears throat> but of course they took it out of mowing before we, you know, when we bought it and, and built the house. And what you mow when you're mowing for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania is all the rootstocks of all of the invasive plants, autumn olive and multiflora rose and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and, and oriental bittersweet and, and on and on and on. So when you stop mowing, that's what comes back. And when we actually moved in, the entire 10 acres looked like that, which means you're not going to do a lot of conservation until you get these invasives under control. It is easier than you think. You just get your wife to do it. And that works. That works. There you go. Cindy did it. She cleaned it all up. Um, I, I don't want to minimize it. It's a lot of work, but fortunately, she she loves doing it. And you have to be vigilant because the little guys keep coming back. But we put a lot of plants back. Uh, and... My research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths, not butterflies, but moths, butterflies are, are day flying, bad tasting moths. And because they don't taste very good, they're not important parts of local food webs. So if you count the number of species of moths in your local food web, you have a very good index of how stable that food web is and how productive it is, how many other species it's supporting. So for the last six years, I have been doing that. I have been counting all the species of moths that I could find on our property, taking a picture of them, I've got a big PowerPoint if you want to see it. And I'm up to 1,259 species of moths that are recorded so far. Got 60 more species last year, so I'm not done yet. There's more, more here than that. Uh, and some of these are really cool cool things, like the chickaping leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil. They've got great names. The horrid zealot, the forgotten frigid owlet. I always feel sorry for the forgotten frigid owlet. The visitation moth, I was excited when I got a visit from the visitation moth, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there is an implicit arches, the snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the morbid owlet, the pink shaded fern moth, the feeble grass moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotis, the cynical quaker, the showy emerald, green marvel, Harris's three spot, the old wife underwing, the eyed pectes, the hog sphinx, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? This is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. And literally hundreds of other species are now making a living on our property. But people say, well, gee, they're going to eat all your plants. You're going to be defoliated. No, why not? Well, because a lot of things are eating those, those caterpillars too. They are the bread and butter of the food web at my house. And one of the major predators of caterpillars are the birds that are there. We have recorded 62 species of birds that have bred on our property. Not flew by, but bred. And they're breeding there because we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of caterpillars uh, that allow these, these birds to reproduce. We also have many uh, insect predators of caterpillars, like ambush bugs, like assassin bugs, like predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of, of milkweed tussock moths and ate one a day, like a vitamin. <clears throat> Got a lot of hymenopter and parasitoids, most of which are hitting the caterpillars uh, on our property. We've got wasps that uh, will sting the, the caterpillars, paralyzing them. Then they carry it off to their, their uh, little mud nest and lay an egg on it. This is nature's form of, of refrigeration. If the wasp had killed the caterpillar, it would rot before that egg even hatched. But because it's paralyzed, it's still alive. It's going to stay nice and fresh. Then the egg hatches and eats the caterpillar while it's still alive. Got vertebrates that are depending on the insects at our house, like skunks, like possums, like raccoons, all the things that ought to be there. Foxes, 25% of a fox's diet, red fox's diet is insects. And of course, we've got amphibians, we've got uh, uh, spring peepers, we've got toads, we've got salamanders, we've got uh, ringneck snakes. We've got the cutest little gray tree frogs, which are actually green when they're, when they're little, and lots of other things that are keeping all of those insects in check. All right, we've talked about what happens uh, when you have a lot of lawn and what can happen when you reduce the amount of lawn, but our lawn goals are too modest. We have to move beyond lawn because most of the property is actually in small woodlots, cropland, or rangeland. 
There's a lot of property in small woodlots, 406 million acres across the country managed by private citizens. And by manage, I mean they are taking the wood from these woodlots, but not by logging companies. And how they're managed and whether or not we control the invasive species in these woodlots is going to determine their biodiversity value. Uh, now, now, organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests are telling us there are two ways you can log a, a uh, or use the wood in a local woodlot. There's high grade harvesting where you take the best trees and you leave the rest. And that provides a good harvest once. And you got to wait about 80 years for another good harvest. Or worse first selection where you're taking those smaller trees that are not as productive, you do it more frequently, but you leave the very best trees. That gives you higher yields over time indefinitely. But you also have to manage the invasive species that are in those woodlots. Invasive plants, of course, are a major issue across the country. Uh, and it's very hard to find a woodlot that is not invaded with plants from, from Asia. This is a, a park near me, White Clay Creek State Park. And all of the green you see, this picture was taken in March when plants from Asia leaf out before plants from North America. So all the green you see are invasive plants in this, this park. It's more than a third of the entire vegetation. But you're not gonna manage your invasive plants uh, unless you manage the deer, white-tailed deer. Again, overabundance of white-tailed deer pretty much across the country. And they're just like our insects. They don't like the non-native plants. They do like the native plants. So they eat all the natives, leave the non-natives. And of course, we've got an invasive species problem. People think those non-natives are such super plants. They're not. It's just that the, the deer won't eat them, but they do eat all the baby oaks and everything else that pops up. So we have an overabundance of the non-natives. Um, very difficult to control your invasive species problem if you don't control your deer. This is what a healthy understory looks like. I went to the Great Smoky Mountains last spring, uh, and this is the Great Smoky Mountains. And the first thing I noticed is that they had this wonderful understory. And I said, how are you managing your deer? And they said, we don't manage our deer. I said, what do you mean you don't manage your deer? He said, we don't manage your deer, but we've got black bears, we've got bobcats, we've got coyotes. Now they don't have any wolves, but those three predators do manage the deer to the point where they don't over browse the understory. Uh, and most of the plants in the understory are young overstory trees. They are, are uh, the young trees waiting for a, a big tree to fall down in a light gap, then they will grow up and replace it. This is a healthy forest ecosystem. This is not. And this is what it looks like around my house. This is Japanese stilt grass, which is pretty much the only thing on the ground. No understory here. The deer have eliminated it. Um, so overbrowsing by deer uh, increases invasive plant problems. It increases the, the population of invasive worms, too. We're not even sure why that happens. <clears throat> There's another serious downside of deer overabundance, of course, and that's Lyme disease. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. So people say, how do you control the deer? Well, you can put the predators back if it's possible, but I get the, I get the, the constraints there. Sharpshooters have been used. You can hire professional sharpshooters. They're not hunting. They are culling the deer. And they often get about a third of the, of the herd. But it's expensive. And a third of the herd's not good enough. Where I live, there's 140 deer per square mile. It should be 12. Um, but then um, Bern Blossy at, at Cornell is proposing to bring back market hunting for deer. Uh, think how well market hunting controlled those, those pesky bison and the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet. Um, it works. But um, we've got to change some rules for that to, that to happen. What do we do in the meantime? We got to put cages around the, the plants you want or you won't have them, at least uh, the way where, where I live. That's, that's the story. All right, cropland. A lot of cropland too. 410 million acres of cropland in, in the US. That's the light green area there. Uh, now, you might think we're not going to get rid of cropland. No, we're not. But there are a lot of things we can do to typical cropland to increase its property value, its biodiversity value, manage the roadsides in a productive way, put the hedgerows back everywhere we can, um, include prairie strips, uh, something new, and limit our use of neonicotinoid insecticides. The monarch is in trouble in this country because we have changed productive roadsides along uh, agriculture to grasslands, to not, not just grasslands, to turf grass. Um, that's where the, you know, they called them weeds. It was milkweed, it was asters, it was, it was New York ironweed, it was goldenrod, it was all the things that monarchs and our native bees and so much other biodiversity needed. It's all been, been replaced with lawn. 
but it can be reversed. We, you know, that was a terrible decision. It was, it was all for aesthetics. Um, and you have to, of course, mow that, that lawn and putting all that carbon up into the atmosphere. In Iowa, for example, they're putting back uh, the prairie plants in those, those uh, roadside verges along agriculture. And you're talking about thousands and thousands of miles of roadside verges. Um, and of course, the, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has been doing this uh, for a long time in, in Texas, but we need to do it everywhere. Um, and again, return the, the hedgerows. Uh, we, we have giant machines. So we said, we'll get rid of all the hedgerows, but that got rid of a tremendous amount of biodiversity. And when you put hedgerows back, uh, they've got to be native plants, not autumn olive, not Russian olive, not, not uh, um, you know, these, these other woody invasives um, because they're not, they're not supporting the biodiversity. We measured caterpillar biomass in uh, hedgerows that were invaded versus hedgerows that were not invaded. And it's a 96% reduction in caterpillar biomass, a 96% reduction in the, the food web value for birds uh, when you use those, those non-natives. Prairie strips, wonderful idea. You put a strip of, of blooming uh, plants that are great for pollinators right through the soybeans, right through the corn. The wider, the better. Uh, and when you do it, perpendicular to the flow of water off the land. Not only is it great for the pollinators, but it's also reducing topsoil loss, which is a serious, serious problem by 95%. It's reducing water pollution. All of the stuff we put on our, our cropland gets intercepted by a prairie strip before it gets into the waterways, reducing that by 90%. And it's there's a cost share uh, a program, the USDA CREP program, um, so the, the farmer is not is not losing here. It's a win-win for everybody. And then finally, we've got to uh, reduce, if we can get rid of uh, neonicotinoid, particularly seed coatings. When it's used as a seed coating, it's not even counted as an insecticide. But it's very tough to buy a seed these days that is not pink or purple, covered with neonicotinoids, a product which is 7,000 times more toxic to insect than DDT was. They're used preventively. So whether or not you have an insect problem, you get seeds coated with, with uh, neonicotinoids. This is the incredible thing. They don't increase yield. If you compare yield in a, a field with, with neonics and a field without neonics, there's no increase in yield. So we're doing this for nothing. Only 5% of the neonicotinoid product is taken up by the plant. The rest, 95% is washed off into the watershed or it blows away on dust where we have no idea what uh, it's it's doing. Um, so lots of good reasons. You know, these of course are banned in, in Europe already. Finally, rangeland, 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas, which is managed for cattle, but it doesn't have to be an ecological disaster. This is a uh, an experimental range in Nebraska. Those are not bison, those are cattle. These are sunflowers. Um, when you don't overgraze, uh, you, you have a whole lot of grassland diversity. Remember, grasslands throughout the world co-evolved with grazers. That's, that's, what gra that's why grass has a meristem at the base, not at the top, because uh, the grazers uh, created that, that evolutionary adaptation. Uh, so grazing is normal, but uh, we can't overgraze. And of course, there's always a tendency to do that. Believe it or not, putting the beavers back. Uh, like we talked about before helps a lot and keeping the cows out of the streams. Beavers, particularly in the Southwest, are critically important to rangelands. Why? Well, they used to uh, manage the streams. There were beaver dams across all the streams. The, the water table was as high as it could be, and it main, maintained a lot of, of uh, wetlands and also water table very near the, the surface so that the grass roots could reach the water and it was much more difficult to overgraze the land then. When we trapped out the beavers, the streams all became incised, the water table dropped, and now it's really easy to overgraze the, uh, uh, the rangeland. So uh, put the beavers back or beaver analog dams to get that water table back up. Uh, and you can really restore the vitality of your, your the, the, the um, waterways through our rangelands. But you also have to keep the cows out of the water because once the willows, and the cottonwoods come back, cows will go and eat them if you, if you let them in there. And of course, willows and cottonwoods are both keystone plants uh, in these Southwest ecosystems. All right, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches, uh, and that is whether or not they succeed depends on the decisions that you and I make. 
I had a student, Amanda Crandall, a few years ago, uh, who during a final, uh, she wrote this. She said, while conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we're really managing is people. And that is so true. This is not a, 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 an ecological or a, a scientific problem. It's a sociological problem. We need to change our society's relationship with nature. Right now, we have an adversarial relationship with nature. We've got to change it to a collaborative one. That is the only way forward. And the question is, can we do it? Of course, we can do it. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save biodiversity where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. More and more people recognize the earth has some serious issues, but so many people feel powerless. What can one person do? Well, one person can do all the things we just talked about. They can shrink the lawn. You can modify your lights. You can add a pollinator garden. You can remove the invasive plants from your, your property. You can add keystone plants. You can fire Mosquito Joe. You can join Homegrown National Park. You can totally revitalize the ecosystem on your property and then enhance your greater local ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You will get depressed. Just think about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer, help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So I hope, we hope that Homegrown National Park is going to provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people to tackle these conservation challenges. Because whether or not we do now is going to determine nature's fate in the very near future. And then, of course, ultimately our own. So I want to leave you with, with the Homegrown National Park Challenge. This is a new thing that I'm, I'm going to try this year. I want each one of you to plant one keystone plant this year. That's it. It'll take you five minutes. Uh, and it seems like that's not a big ass. It's not a big ass, but I want 400,000 of you to do it. So pass it on. All right. Thanks very much. Hi, Doug. Thanks so much for spending time with us. It's inspirational as as expected and, and as usual. So it looks like in the chat box, we have um, a half a dozen questions or so. Um, are you willing to have a go at them? Yeah, sure. Okay. The first one is... Uh, what's your position on using herbicides for the elimination of invasive species? Um, I know this is controversial, <clears throat> but herbicides are an important tool in our, our uh, invasive species toolbox. You have to kill the root systems. Now, it depends on which, which invasive species you're talking about. There are many things you can do without herbicides, but sometimes um, I have found that at least within my lifespan, they're necessary. One of those times would be oriental bittersweet. We had oriental bittersweet vines this big climbing up our trees when we, we uh, signed the papers for our property. And the same day we signed the papers, I went out and I sawed them off at the base. And that's all I did. And that was 23 years ago. The, the little sh uh, offshoots of the root systems that I did not kill are still coming up 23 years later. Oh my when it's very difficult to control them because then each little stem is does not have a big impact on the giant root system that's down there. But things like autumn olive and Russian olive and, and multiflora rose and, and privet and, and uh, buckthorn and many of these shrubby invasives, um, burning bush, uh, they're easily controlled with a mattock. You know, mattock is like a pickaxe, but one end's wide and you just go out there and whack away. You can get that root system out. Good exercise. Um, so you don't have to use insecticides with that. When you're faced with, with a large woody plant uh, that you can't whack out, you can minimize your herbicide uh, use by sawing it off at the base and then just painting, painting the stump with the herbicide. So you're using very little material. Um, it's, a, it's a compromise. I look at herbicides as if, uh, in the same way I look at, at chemotherapy. You've got this tumor growing in you. You can, you can say, I'm not gonna use any chemotherapy, it's poison. It is poison. But if you don't, there's there are big issues. So that's my that's my view of it. Great, great, great point. Hey, next question: What percentage of the current yards in the U.S., if planted with natives, would reverse the decline in insect populations? Well, I have re reversed the decline of insect populations on my ten acres. What percentage of that is in the entire country? Tiny, tiny, tiny. Although. 
so we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is, is, wow, geez, I forgot the figures now. I think it's 210 million acres. So on just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the 210 million acres, we've got 48% of all the moths that occur in the entire state. So mm -hmm. the more, the better, but um, no contribution is too small. I want all of it <laughs> to be planted in natives, but uh, I don't want people to say it's not worth it. I'm not going to put it in my oak tree. And remember, migrating birds are migrating. They are stopping at at stopover points, but they will stop at a single tree if it's got got food. So even if you're in the middle of a city, and you put in a an oak that's going to support a lot of caterpillars. You are helping migrating birds. So so no area is too small. Right. That actually helps me. I, I have to keep remembering that. Otherwise, I get depressed. <laughs> okay, next question. Can you describe a pie chart with the impacts which are causing the decline in insects? Pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, light pollution, loss of habitat, invasive, and non-native plants. So I guess which is the worst culprit, I guess, is what it's asking. Uh, who, yeah, whoever's asking that question has a pretty good feel for it. Dave Wagner says that insect decline is, is death by a thousand cuts. You know, habitat loss covers a lot of, of territory, and that certainly is a major, major factor. Industrial agriculture, in the ways we talked about, is a major factor. Uh, this unknown uh, contributions from, from blowing uh, neonicotinoids and what's in the watershed uh, is certainly contributing. Light pollution is a huge one. I mean, you look at that that uh, sky, the space shuttle picture of, of the Earth at night, and you can see where we have light pollution. And all of those places, uh, those lights are killing insects every night, uh, particularly the moths that, that uh, run the ecosystem. Um, cars kill a lot of insects, uh, you know, uh, millions of insects for sure. Uh, but, you know, can I, can I, can I rank them? Mm. I don't know. I would say, I would say, and, and invasive plants. I even, we just wrote a paper last year about the impact of invasive plants, of non-native plants, whether they're invasive or not, in reducing uh, the, the forage that our insects need. I would put non-native plants way up there, insecticides way up there, and light pollution way up there as the top three. So, you know, where, who's the top worst one? I don't know. <laughs> the big three. <clears throat> Okay, this is a rate the state one. Which, what state do you think is making the most changes to improve habitat? And then which state is doing the least? Well, one thing I didn't mention, if you go to the biodiversity map on Homegrown National Park, the states are color coded. So the ones with the most numbers and the most acres um, are, are the greenest. So you can look at your state and, and see how you're doing. I, I can't remember how Texas is doing, but... <laughs> Well, I, uh, someone posted in the chat box, a couple people did, the link to go to Homegrown National Park. So we should all be able to do that. So thanks. Um, why are invasive plants still allowed to be sold in the U.S.? Well, they're not allowed to be sold everywhere. Uh, they're against the law in a number of eastern states. Delaware passed the law last year that says you can't sell them anymore. Massachusetts has banned a number of them. Uh, Maryland's banned a number of them. North Carolina, uh, South Carolina. Uh, so they're being banned. Why are they, you know, it's, it because it's a political thing. The, the horticultural trade has a, a huge lobby. Um, it's interesting though. I, I was on the committee that helped ban them in Delaware. Uh, but so were the, all of the major nurserymen of the state and they favored the ban. They understand the reasons why selling these things is, is, um, it's just not ethical. Uh, but if you if you don't sell them voluntarily and the guy down the street does sell them, the, the public is still so uninformed, ill-informed that they will they will buy it from the other guy. So they want them banned across, you know, across the state so that nobody has a competitive advantage. And the argument that they're going to lose sales is ridiculous. People still plant plants. We're just changing the inventory. We're not saying you're going to have no plants out there. So um States are moving in that direction, but uh, they're certainly not there yet in most places. Great, thanks. Susan, are we okay to keep going here? It's uh, 8.04, we okay? Yes, absolutely. Okay, a couple more then. Um, how, do you, how do the farm's fertilizer runoff affect 
the prairie strips. The prairie strips uh, intercept the fertilizer runoff. It's one of their major advantages. That's the pollution that they're reducing by 90%. And of course that fertilizes the, the, the you know, all those prairie plants that are helping the pollinators. So it, it really is a, it's a wonderful solution to several of our problems, the loss of topsoil, the, the, the uh, pollution problem and the loss of pollinators, the loss of habitat. Okay, thanks. Next one's a, I don't know, the next one, I don't know if it has an answer, but in terms of the mammals on your property, feeding on the caterpillars, like you mentioned, um, opossums and skunks, how can we make sure to coexist with them without them being an issue to humans, like getting in our trash, attacking our animals, et cetera? Yeah, part of the problem is that we've we've rebuilt part of the ecosystem, but not all of the ecosystem. Those are called mesopredators, but we don't have the top predators. Um, so every time you shoot a coyote, you're you're shooting yourself in the foot with control of of raccoons and and possums and skunks. Um, and what we really need are the wolves back. I mean, those 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 top predators are what kept the mesopredators at reasonable numbers. So it's a good question. Uh, we it's also very hard on the birds to have too many coons, for example, because they raid the birds' nests. Um, you don't want too many coons, but no coons is not the answer either. What we do want is is balance in our ecosystems. And when you only have part of it rebuilt, that's hard. It is hard. Okay. Bob, bobcats are a, a good solution. And they're so secretive, you know, they're not out there killing everybody. So I go for bobcats. <laughs> <laughs> you have them here every once in a while. So yeah, good. So good deal. Okay. Why are some plants not listed as invasive plants, such as I'll give you an example, um, a sago palm? Well, sago palm's not invasive, but it they're not listed because they're not invasive. Remember, not, an in not... all invasive plants are non-native, but not all non-natives are invasive. The ginkgos are not invasive. You know, they're totally non-native, but they're not spreading in our ecosystems. They're not pushing native plants out. That's the definition of, a, of an invasive plant. It's a non-native plant that's aggressively displacing native plant communities. So it depends on the plant's behavior. Okay, here's one that's fairly long. Let me see if I can summarize. What would greatly help is to have a group that gives away plants for our area. Is this a thing? I know I have a plant group that shares plants, but to have a group that knows and has Homegrown National Park in mind as their mission. Also, I'm the Civic Club president of my subdivision. I know at least three homes in our 52 homes are going natural in the front yard. We could encourage more at the Civic Club level with helpful resources. Sharing plants would help. Sharing plants and also reducing the stigma against it. You know, the reason yeah. people don't do this is they're afraid the peer pressure is going to, uh, you know, make it hard. But yes, people are are sharing plants. Most people in a typical suburban yard, if they get the native plants going, they produce more plants than they can handle. So they want to they want to give some away. They want to give the seeds away. Some people are are putting out. You know, the tiny little libraries you have on street corners sometimes, mm -hmm. they're putting out, putting out packages of seeds there. The demand for native plants now exceeds the supply. So any any little um, local uh, plant propagation or, 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 you know, nursery operations like this are very helpful. Uh, somebody told me, I can't even remember who it was, but it wasn't long ago, told me about their kids. He had two kids who sold propagated and sold native plants every summer uh, and they made thousands of dollars. <laughs> so, and then I said, did they have a permit? He said, oh, I don't think so. Yeah. But um, there's a demand out there. So there sure is. They could make a bunch here. We're always asking, where can we go? Where can we go? So, yeah. Well, that's it for questions. So I want to thank you so much for your time. It was, it was great as usual to listen and learn from you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And um, everybody's clapping. So you should see all the claps. <laughs> sure, yeah. um, um, before we transition to the next, I just wanted to tell the people that are on the line uh, what an interesting next, interesting and related next month topic we have. 
Mary Spolier is coming to talk with us at the Rosenberg Civic Center. And believe it or not, her topic is going to be night critters with a specific focus on moths. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I should so <laughs> it should be a fun program. So for those of you interested, look on our website and you will see the link probably tomorrow. Um, you will see information on the program with a link to follow shortly thereafter. So I hope you'll join us either in person or via Zoom to learn more about Night Critters. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our president, Susan Walther, to close the meeting. Doug, I want to thank you again. If if we had all had our videos on, you would have seen us nodding and clapping the whole way through. You were, in, in most cases, preaching to the choir, but it's so awesome to see some examples of where good is being done, it steps in the right direction. Right. Well, and, and you are a step in the right direction, Doug, and we want to join you. Uh, thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.